Praise God, Faith family. I am so glad you're here this evening. As we turn to the Word of God, take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. We're in the middle of a message that the Lord has been teaching, going from teaching the multitudes that are literally trampling one another, to then, to then turning aside and speaking just to the twelve right around him, with the crowd listening in. Then he changes and he turns his attention back to the full crowd. It's been quite the eventful day for the Lord here in the Gospel of Luke. It began with healing, uh, casting out a demon possessed, uh, the demon out of a demon possessed man who was mute. And then from there, lunch at a Pharisee's house, and then teaching the crowds all afternoon. We saw that there's this eschatological, it's a fancy word for saying end times, theme running through all of the teaching of Jesus in Luke 12 and 13. He's letting the crowd know that there is coming a day when we will all be before God and we will either be in heaven with, us, with our Savior or we will be perishing in the lake of fire. And so this is really a, a call to the gospel in all of these verses. There was an interruption in his teaching from that rich, that one man who said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus spoke about the covetousness of his heart. Beware of all kinds, all forms of covetousness. Because why would you work so hard to lay up treasure on earth when the moment you die, all of your goods go to somebody else or they go in a dumpster? Why would we invest all of our time and energy in the things that are perishing rather than the things which are eternal? So we've got this whole eternal, long-range, future mentality that we need to be having. We need to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all those other things will be added. Things like food and clothing and day-to-day -day life. Um, we were challenged this morning to be like the, the servants where the master's gone away to a wedding banquet and the wedding banquet would, would take place over many, many days and they had no idea when the master was coming back. But at the banquet, the master's thinking, I have servants back home that I care very deeply about. I love them and I want to provide for them. So he takes probably some wedding feast food, brings it over, knocks, and blessed is the, is the, are the servants who immediately open the door and are ready and expecting the master to come home. What does the master do? He girds himself. He tells the sl slaves, you recline at the table, and I, your master, will serve you. Wow, that is humbling. So not only do we need to be expecting the Lord's return, we need to be faithfully serving. And there's uh, two kinds of servants, those that are wise and faithful, that to whom much has been given, much will be required. Then those who are not believers, but they're professing the gospel, but they don't believe truly, and so um, they misuse and abuse their authority, and God casts them into the portion of the unbelievers. But remember, as much has been given to us, much will be required. Before we pray and begin, can I ask you a thought or a question and have you think about this? Could there be any generation that will be more accountable than ours? Think about it. Think, would there ever be a generation before us that would be as, as accountable as us? We have a plethora of Bibles and Bible translations. We have so many versions and we have so many ways to understand. We can hear podcasts and preaching and teaching. We've got videos and TV and we've got um, all sorts of electronic devices. Like there, we have more opportunity than ever, than any other generation, to know the Word of God and to live it out. And the Lord himself said, to, to whom much has been given, much will be required. I do think he will hold our generation into greater account than maybe any other generation before. We have so much, like we have the whole plan of God and we're nearing the end of the days. Who could have ever thought, like Revelation says, that um, two witnesses in Jerusalem will be slain and for three and a half days, all the world will view their bodies in Jerusalem. My grandmother never would have thought that people in Minnesota could see Jerusalem live on their watches and on their phones. But now we can see how the whole world could view these two dead witnesses for three and a half days. And then there's a miraculous resurrection as they're caught up to heaven. Do you see? We, we have so much understanding and wisdom, at least knowledge, that we, that we must work with and apply. Well, let's pray. And then we're going to continue this theme that Jesus is speaking, but now he's going to address the crowd, and his key word is urgency. Time is running out 
You must believe in the Lord Jesus or you will perish. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the word of God. Oh, it is so profitable. And as we just are enjoying looking at the life of Jesus, learning from his words and from his actions, just seeing his power and, and grace, we are overwhelmed and amazed. And he is calling forth to his generation. There's an urgency. The return of the Lord is at any time for us. Death could be at any moment. Today is the day of salvation. And yet this world is blinded and they cannot see. And so they laugh and mock and put this off and maybe never put their faith in Jesus. And then they perish when they die. So help us to be able to use these four little teachings of the Lord that have great theological weight. Help, us, help them to shape our attitudes and our mindset as we encounter the world. Thank you, Father, for the gospel and how it has freed us from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and someday the presence of sin itself. We praise and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to talk about four things. Weather, a courtroom scene, two local news stories, and a barren fig tree. And I'm going to ask you, what do those things, what, do the, what is the weather forecast? Going to a courtroom, two local headline news stories, and then uh, barren fig tree all have in common. Well, um, it is going to reveal the unbelief of Israel and the crowd that is listening. And it's going to teach us something about the urgency of, of the gospel. And so let's begin with this weather report. Luke chapter 12, verse 54. Then, so in the same teaching, the same context as the rich farmer who is a fool, the do not worry about food and clothing, the ravens and the lilies, and the master at the wedding banquet, all in the same teaching, here's what Jesus says, verse 54. He said to the multitudes, he's turned his attention from the 12, and now there's this massive multitude that he's calling out to. Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower's coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, hmm, there will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Do you see this? The, the people had some discernment about weather forecasts. In the Middle East, when there's a wind blowing from the west, the Mediterranean Sea is to the west of Israel. Anybody knows when the west wind is blowing, it's going to bring all that moisture from the Mediterranean. It's going to come across the plain of Sharon. It's going to come up the Ephraim mountains, and then it's going to get caught there, and it's going to then descend with rain on the other side of the mountain. And so they know rain is coming, a storm is coming. Any time that the wind was coming from the south, that's the land of Egypt to the south, all that hot Sahara desert wind is coming, and literally it comes up and it just camps down like a hot oven in Israel. And when you know there's a south wind, what do you do? Do you grab your long underwear and your hat and your gloves? No. When, you, when it's a south wind, even the most simple person would realize, I am going to be sweating. It is going to get hot. When the west wind is coming, somebody's thinking, I need an umbrella. I'm going to get wet. See, we have this kind of common sense and discernment. Jesus says, you hypocrites. How can you understand these basic weather things, understanding when the weather's going to turn rainy or when it's going to turn hot and dry, and yet you do not understand that the Messiah is in your midst and that you need to trust him before judgment falls. Because if you do not trust him and you die, you will perish. How can you have so much understanding about what's going to happen in the weather, but you have no understanding what's going to happen in your very own future? Now, if I were to say to you all, um, there's an east wind blowing in Duluth. Well, immediately, what are you thinking? The lake effect. Either a storm or the temperature is going to drop 20 degrees. You know, it's 80, like the other day, it was 80 or 81 up here at the church, and I had all the windows open, and I ran home, um, got some lunch, and I thought, oh, I don't have any appointments, counseling or anything, so I just, I put on shorts and a, and a, and a t-shirt, and we were going to have men's Bible study. Within a half an hour, the temperature dropped from 80 with an east wind down to like, what, 42? And I was like, close the windows, the heat's going to kick on. How can you go from 80 in one day 
uh, in, in an afternoon to 40, 42. The, the east wind, even I know that. I'm not that smart, but I, I understand when the wind's blowing off the lake, it is going to get cold. Jesus says, then how can you not know that someday you are going to die and you're going to face the judge of all the earth? And if you do not have faith in Jesus, you will perish. How can you not understand that? Listen, men and women, we need to be deliverers of the good news. We need to present the bad news that all mankind has sinned against God and is deserving and worthy of death, eternal death. But then we have to warn them and say, if you guys can understand a weather forecast, if you know what a northeaster is, if you know, if you know some basic things about clouds and rainstorms and patterns, then why can you not know that you were created in God's image, you have rebelled against him, and you are going to face him someday? And the only way to face him is in the righteousness of Jesus, not your own righteousness. This is hypocritical, to understand these earthly things, but not understand the spiritual things. Again, it's the blindness of Israel that produces this. He says in verse 56, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, meaning the west wind and the south wind, and then even matters of the earth. But how is it you do not discern this time? To the generation Jesus is speaking of, they have had three years of miracles. They have heard reports of lame men walking, blind people being able to see, deaf people able to hear, mute people that can speak, dead people that are now up and walking around, demon-possessed people that are now clothed and in their right mind, teaching after teaching, miracle after miracle. Jesus did more miracles in Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida than anywhere else on the whole planet. And those were the three main rejecting cities. His own hometown, he did more miracles than any place, and they refused to believe. How could they not believe that he is the Messiah? If you're one of the 5,000 and you know that Jesus had only a few loaves and some small fish to feed the entire group and everybody not only was well fed, there was 12 baskets of leftovers, would you not begin to think there's something about Jesus that is different? If you know the widow at Nain who you were at her husband's funeral and then you were at the son's funeral and the son is on a stretcher, and Jesus stops the funeral procession and touches the dead boy, and then speaks to the dead boy and says, Son, arise. And he gets up out of the coffin or out of the stretcher, and he walks away in perfect health. Can you not discern the time and who is in your midst? This is God in your midst. And this is what Jesus tells the whole crowd. But he's not done. He's just done that with the weather. Now he's going to speak about going to the court to meet a judge. Verse 57, yes. And why even of yourselves, you massive crowd, do you not judge what is right? Can, can you not discern right and wrong? Do you not know good and bad, right and wrong, light and dark, sweet and bitter? Do you, do you have no brains, he says? Do you not understand? He's going to make another case. Verse 58, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, Ah, now we've got courtroom terms. We're not talking about the weather forecast now. He's changed his entire theme. He's talking about a magistrate and an adversary. An adversary is your enemy. Somebody is suing you and taking you to court. And you know that your enemy and yourself are going to the magistrate or the judge. He is going to hear the opinions and he's going to rule and you have no idea if your case is strong enough. You all agree? Do you understand what Jesus is saying? When you go with your adversary, verse 58, to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last mite. Jesus says, when you're walking to court with an enemy, you do everything, make, he says, Make every effort to settle before you reach the judge. Because it could be that the judge throws you in prison and you never get out. Do you really want to face a judge knowing that your case is not going to be strong enough and the judge has the power to say, you are locked up and never have freedom ever again? No, Jesus says, if you have any rightness in your brain, if you can think on your own, you are going to talk to your adversary and say, okay, what do we need to do to settle this? 
out of court because I don't want to go before the judge in case he rules against me. Now, who is the adversary and who is the judge? I think the adversary is Jesus. We're walking along life and we're like, Jesus, I know I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. Um, I, Father, I, I, know, I know that I deserve eternal death. I know that I'm your enemy. And I know someday I'm going to meet God the Father. So before I meet God the Father, let's settle this. How can I be made right with you, Jesus? And Jesus would say, what? Believe. Trust in my grace through faith alone. Abandon your religious rights. Abandon your religion, your idolatry. All of those things and put your faith, your trust fully in me. That's what you need to do. If you do that, we can settle right here and now. You get your eternal life and you never face the judge. See, isn't that wise? So we have to tell this world they are literally walking through life with Jesus and Jesus is begging them to settle their accounts by faith in him. And if they don't settle with him by trusting him, they are going to meet God the judge, the judge of all the earth, at the great white throne judgment. And there it's going to be Jesus Christ, John 5 says. Jesus Christ is going to say, depart from me, all you wicked, for I never knew you. And, they, and he will cast them into a lake of fire, utter darkness forever. See, isn't Jesus wise? He tells the whole crowd, why would you ever want to face God the judge if you can settle with Jesus ahead of time by trusting him, by believing in him? You are foolish if you think you have a case against the, the holy almighty God. Your case fails, you will go for an eternity to hell. So go quickly, make, settle you with your adversary. And by the way, the only way we can settle with our adversary is to trust what he did for us on the cross and, and his resurrection. So that's the courtroom scene. Do you see how there's an urgency? Every step you take, how cl you're closer to the judge, right? Hey, if you were not saved today, which is May 28th, 2023, you'll probably still be alive May 29th, 2023, but you're one day closer to meeting the judge. And if you don't get saved throughout the month of June, then July 1st, 2023, you're going to be that much closer to meeting the judge. And you can play the game and think, well, I don't have to worry. I'm going to live another 20 years. I can deal with this later. You may not make it through tonight, and you may be facing the God of, the God of all the earth, the judge of this world, tonight. And it's going to be too late. Then you can't settle because you will have to pay your sins in, in, a, in a lake of fire. He now moves to a third teaching, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. You know how it is, everybody. Um, nobody likes to talk, except me, likes to talk about their own death. Anytime we start talking about death, what do people like to talk about? Uh, somebody else's death. Uh, but you know, so-and-so, they had this tragedy and accident. I don't want to be thinking about my own death. I want to think about something else. Let's get off the topic. Because this is making me a little uncomfortable. So some people in the crowd, they're like beginning to get sweaty. And they're like, I think Jesus is talking about us, that we need to be right with the God of the earth. And we need to settle with Jesus. And, all, and we need to be able to discern. If we can discern the weather, we better discern that judgment is coming. And we better be prepared. So now, chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season, during this teaching time, some who told him, and again, I don't know if this was the same teaching, but it, Luke puts it in here because it fits the whole context of what he's teaching. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What's Jesus doing here? Verse 1. So there were present in, the, in, the, in this group, in this crowd that he's talking to, um, or at least in this season of his ministry, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. It made headline news. Here they are. People from the Galilee walked or rode donkeys 70 miles down to Jerusalem. These Galileans are worshiping in the temple, and Pilate... Pontius Pilate put out a hit on them. 
he told some hitmen, I want you to go to the temple. There's these Galileans, and they're up in the temple. They're worshiping Yahweh. I want you to kill them. Kill them while they're in the act of giving their sacrifice. And sure enough, Pilate's men went up on the Temple Mount during a worship service and killed these Galileans, and the news spread everywhere. And now these people are saying to Jesus, Yeah, um, Jesus, let's not be talking about my own mortality and my own facing God. What about these Galileans? That, do you know what Pilate did? What do you think about Pilate? I, th- I, th- I think... They're trying to get Jesus to go against Rome and talk about how bad Pilate is and what a terrible governor, what an evil man. You know, just to get the heat off them, let's get them angry at Pilate because of what Pilate did. Jesus turns the whole conversation around. Look at how Jesus responds. Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Sure, they were mowed down. They were, they were murdered by Pilate's men. But do you really think that, that, that the reason they were killed by Pilate's men is because they were far worse sinners? Do you think that because something happens bad, it, it speaks about the degree of human sinfulness? Here's what Jesus says. Listen, everybody. There is something far worse than a terrible human tragedy like these murders. And that is dying and going to hell, perishing forever in a lake of fire. Human tragedies are all over the place. Car accidents, murders, all sorts of terrible things that we are not exempt from. But there's something far worse than these tragedies of murders and such, and it is dying without salvation, not being saved, not being born again. That is far worse than these Galileans being killed by Pilate. And so Jesus says to the whole crowd, you have a problem. What happened to those Galileans could happen to any one of us, but there's something far greater. If you die without salvation, you will perish. You must put your faith. Jesus says, repent or you will perish. This idea of repentance is faith. You need to change your mind about what you're trusting, No longer be trusting your good works, your religion, anything that you can offer, but you're trusting the Lord alone. And now that that's faith, and now that you're trusting, then you will not perish. And then Jesus brings up his own situation. He says, verse 4, of of those 18, um, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men? Now, this is an architectural failing. There is some tower in Siloam, and there, 18 people are either in the tower or around the tower. The architecture fails, and then the tower collapses and falls, and, and it kills 18 people. Do you remember just, uh, what, a few years ago down in Florida, there was uh, like a three-apartment building complex, and like the middle one had a structural failure because like the, I think the swimming pool was leaking and it corroded the, the main support post and those apartments collapsed and, and people died. And then the other two apartments stood for a while. I mean, stood, but I think eventually they tore the whole thing down. What a tragedy. But those people living in those apartments that died in that accident, it's not because they were worse sinners than us that they died. Just tragedies happen. Um, All of these human tragedies, all these earthly disasters, I think, are eternal caution lights. When I first heard about the Twin Towers falling on 9-11, it was a Tuesday morning, and I was, um, I remember, I remember hearing the news of this, and when we, when we heard that over 3,000 died in those Twin Towers, and then others at the Pentagon, and then others in the field and in Pennsylvania and at Shanksville, um, to me, it was an eternal caution light. My first thought was, how many of those people knew the Lord? Because at, at, what a tragic and a horrible thing to happen. But what, what would be far more tragic is for people in the towers or out to die without Jesus and perish. That is is absolutely heartbreaking and grieving. And so Jesus says, whether it's murders up on the Temple Mount or a tower that falls and collapses suddenly without anybody knowing and then 18 people die, 
There's something far worse than these t- terrible disasters and tragedies, and it is dying without Christ. There's an urgency. Like any one of us uh, could get in an accident, and any one of us could die at any point. But what would be far worse than that, than that is for somebody to die and perish in the long run. And then finally, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus says in verse 6, he also spoke this parable. He's got one more teaching. We've talked about discerning the weather. We've talked about making peace before you reach the judge, making peace with your adversary before you reach the judge. We've talked about these natural disasters or human tragedies with murders and such, but there's something far more worse and eternal, and that would be dying without Christ, without salvation. See all the urgency in all of this? And then finally in verse 6, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, Let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Well, now, what's this have to do with the same theme that Jesus is talking about? Well, do you know in the Old Testament, it said kind of a sign of Israel's prosperity. It said every family could sit under their vine and fig tree. Remember that that terminology? The prosperity of Solomon, Solomon's days were so glorious that literally everybody in Israel, the economy was so great, everybody, every household could sit under their own own vine and fig tree. Jesus says in the millennial kingdom, Israel, on this regenerated earth, every family will sit under their vine and fig tree. So these vines and fig trees fit together. Here's why. Of course, you'd want a vineyard in your house. If you had any property you'd want a vineyard on your property because the grape juice, the fresh grape juice, would last and sustain and all of the antioxidants and the blessing of all of that is wonderful. But, but it, with the property being so small and narrow in Israel, you would use every little piece it, it, for whatever you could. And, and figs and, and vineyards, fig trees and vineyards, go, they work well together in the same soil. So it would be very natural if you have a little bit of corner or space left in a vineyard to plant a fig tree. Then you get some shade and you get some figs as well. And so here this this illustration is, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And and he comes seeking fruit on it because fig trees are known for their fruitfulness. They just easily bear much fruit. But this fig tree vineyard owner finds no fruit. Then he said to the keeper of this vineyard, to his caretaker, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Every year during the season, he'd come out to the fig tree and look around its branches. Not a fig to be seen, not a fig to be found. And he's like, Okay, another year. Another year passes. And then another year. Now it's been three years. And he tells his caretaker, Get your axe and cut this thing down to the roots. Why is it using up the ground? But the caretaker says, Sir, let's give it one more year. I'm going to dig around the roots, kind of stir those roots up, get them active again. Then I'm going to put some dung and some fertilizer around it. And we're going to try one more year to get fruit on this tree. And if no fruit shows up, Master, then I'll cut it down. Is that a deal? Okay, do you see what's going on? Who's the fig tree? Israel's the fig tree. How long has Jesus been in Israel in a public ministry teaching and performing signs and miracles? Three years. He has given Israel three years of eyewitness accounts of his glory and grace. And Israel refuses to believe. As a whole, the nation is rejecting and hostile to Jesus. Now listen to this, everybody. From Luke 9, 51, which is the beginning of the journey to Jerusalem, until chapter 19, verse 28, when he gets to Jerusalem. So you've got Luke 9, 51, to Luke 19, 58. The whole travel journey of Jesus is 38 sections. I could take you, there are 38 different sections, and out of that, 22, Israel 
And Jewish people are hostile, rejecting, and angry with Jesus. 22 out of the 38 episodes that I talk about in the next few weeks are going to be filled with hostility, rejection, and anger. Israel will not believe in their Messiah. And so Jesus is like, okay, it's been a three-year ministry. I've got six months left, and then I'm going to the cross. And after that, if there's no fruit, I set you on the shelf. We'll start the church age, and then Israel, I'll come back, and then you'll bear much fruit. And so he's, he's telling Israel, your time and urgency of opportunity is short. If you don't get saved now, then you may never get saved. And sure enough, Jesus dies on the cross. And by AD 70, Titus and Vespasian have come down. They have leveled Jerusalem and destroyed the whole city. And many, many people have either perished or been taken captive by the Romans. And then they're going to be dispersed amongst all the nations. Literally, the fig tree is over until 1948 when they've been regathered in their land. Are they bearing fruit yet? No, not much. But someday, Israel will be a believing nation, and they will bear, they'll be the fig tree that bears much fruit. So Jesus is saying, you have an opportunity. You are a fig tree with no fruit. I'm going to give you a short window of opportunity to be saved. And then after that, judgment will fall. So to close, go to second, this is it for me, then 2 Corinthians 6, it ties it all together. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh, let's go to chapter 5, sorry. We'll begin in chapter 5, verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 19. I think this is a good summary of what Jesus is teaching with the forecast of the weather. The courtroom scene, making peace with your enemy before you get to the judge. These two local news stories and a barren fig tree. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us, that's us, you, you and I church age believers, the ministry of reconciliation, or the word, he says, of reconciliation. So listen, everybody. God has given you and I in the church age the word of reconciliation. The word of how can man, who is sinful and rebellious, find peace with the holy God? This is the word we have to deliver. Now, I believe, and this is how I've preached it in the past, that verses 20, 21, and then chapter 6, 1 and 2, is the word of reconciliation. I don't think the chapter 6 should start where it does. So hang on, can you stay with me for just a minute, everybody? God has committed to you and I this word of reconciliation. But my question would be, Paul, what is the word of reconciliation? This urgent gospel message that we need to give. What's the urgent message, this word of reconciliation? He begins in verse 20. This, I believe, is now the gospel message that Paul wants us to give, the word of reconciliation. Look at verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, unbelievers, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this is what I go to the world and I say this. World, God, I am an ambassador of Christ. I'm an ambassador of God. He has sent me on a mission to declare to you to be reconciled to him. And then he goes on, verse 21, for he, God the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That's the substitutionary death of Jesus, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is our word of reconciliation. World, I'm an ambassador of Christ. God has committed to me a word of reconciliation. How do you find peace with God? Well, God had Jesus, who knew no sin, become sin for us, that we might receive the righteousness of Christ in him. Now look at chapter 6. We then, as workers together with God, also plead with you, I beg with you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. People, I need to go to the, everybody on the street or at the school or wherever, and I need to plead with them. Do not receive the grace of God in emptiness, in vanity. Don't take the gospel message and throw it aside. You will perish if you do. Then he says, verse 2, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that's where the word ends. 
My final word to the world is this. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time to trust Jesus and be reconciled to God. Now, today, is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Why? Why is this important to know my message? Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. A tower could fall on me. I could be murdered. There's no guarantee for tomorrow. If I, can, if I can discern the east wind off of Lake Superior, I should understand this life is pretty fragile and I might meet Jesus someday. I better be prepared and ready. If I know I'm going to the judge and I'm walking with my adversary, I better make it right with him in case the judge doesn't rule in my favor. So I better get right with Jesus before I meet the God of, and judge of all the world. And, um, and then finally, a fig tree. If the fig tree does not bear fruit, there's a window of opportunity. And then after its unfruitfulness, it's going to get hewn down and thrown in a fire. You don't put your faith in Jesus. You're going to get hewn down and thrown in a fire, a lake of fire. So do you see why Paul is so emphatic? He ends his gospel message with, today is the day of salvation, now is the acceptable time, because tomorrow is not guaranteed. See the urgency in all of this? I think Jesus is so passionate when he's talking to the crowd and he's like, listen crowd, you don't have a lot of time. Listen, our world does not have a lot of time. It doesn't. The the clock is ticking and every day we're closer to the rapture. And should the rapture take place this week? Boy, within seven years or some seven years plus time, the second coming will have happened. Then the kingdom begins and a thousand year reign on this regenerated earth. And then a great white throne judgment.